Hey, 42 here. Tucked away in a cupboard somewhere in the medical department of the University of Sao Paulo is a 40-year-old human skeleton. To the trained eye, the bones offer a window into the former owner's life. A hip fracture points to an old motorbike accident, and a tiny hole in the left cheekbone hints at severe sinusitis. That aside, it's pretty much a standard issue human skeleton, one that's helped hundreds of Brazilian forensic science students to better understand how to identify human remains. But this apparently unassuming human skeleton hides one hell of a secret. Because in life, it belonged to one of the most evil human beings ever to walk the earth. Now, I admit there's a fair amount of hyperbole going around on YouTube these days, so I'd forgive you for thinking I'm exaggerating here for effect. But trust me, this isn't clickbait. You see, the classroom skeleton at Sao Paulo University once belonged to a Nazi war criminal who was personally responsible for the deaths of an estimated 400,000 people. That on its own is mind-bogglingly evil, but it gets even worse because this man also used his position as a doctor working at the notorious Auschwitz concentration camp to undertake some of the most brutal, depraved experiments ever carried out in the name of science. Experiments that use live humans as their subjects. This Nazi mass murderer was called Josef Mengele, but the inmates at Auschwitz had another, more fitting name for him, the Angel of Death. This is his story. Now I'll admit I love a bit of pampering as much as the next man, but I don't typically do much in the way of wellness and beauty regimens. But that's all changed since I discovered Ferreo. Ferreo Sweden is shaking up the wellness world. It's a visionary brand in the space where the beauty and tech worlds meet. Such as the Luna device that deep cleans your pores, reducing breakouts. To develop this product alone, it took Ferreo 10 years, drawing on talents from a multidisciplinary team of dermatologists, cellular biologists, dietitians, and estheticians. The ISA range is the world's first silicon sonic toothbrush. It's bacteria resistant, tough on plaque, and gentle on gums. But my personal favorite is Ferreo's UFO range. It's a professional facial treatment device at home, which thanks to its T-Sonic pulsation pushes mask ingredients deep into the skin. It's amazingly clever stuff. So to get a spa quality facial treatment at home, use UFO2 by Ferreo Sweden, an amazing supercharged facial device. Click the link in the description and use the coupon code 4020 to get 20% off. Thanks to Ferreo for sponsoring this video. Delving into the early years of history's most twisted individuals often turns up tales of hardship or abuse, but that wasn't the case for young Josef Mengele. He was born in the picturesque Bavarian town of Gunsberg on the 16th of March 1911 and his father was the founder and owner of a successful farming equipment manufacturer. As a lad, Josef was one of those absolute bastards who seemed to be good at everything. He was a strong student and a capable sportsman with an interest in the arts, and combined with his good looks and natural charm, he enjoyed no shortage of interest from the opposite sex. He excelled in further education too, studying philosophy in Munich, medicine in Frankfurt, and eventually earning himself a PhD in anthropology. In 1937, he got a job at the Institute for Hereditary Biology and Racial Hygiene in Frankfurt. There, he worked under Ottmar Freiherr von Vischer, a Dutch nobleman and scientist with an interest in eugenics and a belief in forcibly sterilizing people with undesirable genetic traits. In other words, he was an arsehole. And Mengele quickly bought into his arseholy ideas, particularly the ones about a racial hierarchy that put people like him on top and everyone else on the bottom. A man with Mengele's scientific interest was a natural fit for the racist ideology of the Nazi party, and he became a member in 1937, signing up to Hitler's personal paramilitary, the SS, the following year. Those were happy times for Mengele. He married his first wife, Irene, in July 1939. When the Second World War kicked off two months later, huh? Mengele volunteered huh? for medical service with the Waffen-SS, 
and by all accounts, he was an excellent soldier, serving primarily in France and Russia and winning several medals in the process, including an Iron Cross first class for rescuing two men from a burning tank. His time on the front lines came to an end in 1942 when he was wounded in battle, but a man with a mind like Mengele's still had its uses and in early 1943, he was transferred to Auschwitz. He was given the role of camp physician, though that title was so inappropriate it's almost laughable. Nazi doctors like Mengele never treated the inmates, who were simply dispatched to the gas chambers when they fell seriously ill. No, Mengele's duties at Auschwitz had nothing to do with patient care. In fact, they'd have given Hippocrates of Cos an aneurysm. As well as being a place to commit mass murder on a scale never before seen in history, concentration camps like Auschwitz were also used for forced labour. And so the first thing to do when a new trainload of inmates arrived was determine who amongst them was fit enough to work. This process was known as selection, and it was the job of Nazi doctors to make that call. It's estimated that at least 75% of all the people who arrived at Auschwitz, including almost all children, pregnant women, and the elderly, were immediately deemed unfit for work and sent straight to the gas chambers. To put that into context, it's thought that close to a million people were murdered as soon as they arrived at the camp. Under Mengele's direct orders, 400,000 souls, including tens of thousands of children, were sent to the gas chambers. There are reports that some SS doctors found this task somewhat unpleasant. I mean, you'd bloody hope so. But not Mengele. He relished it. In fact, he enjoyed his work so much that he was regularly seen smiling and whistling on the job. And he'd even turn up to help out when he wasn't officially on shift. But it turned out there was an ulterior motive for all that overtime. You see, Mengele had realized Auschwitz was the perfect place to continue his research into the empirical superiority of the Aryan race. In the eyes of the Nazis, inmates at the camp weren't truly human, and that opened up certain opportunities. Using a grant secured by his old mentor, Arsehole Freiherr von Verschur, Mengele built a lab at Auschwitz that would use the camp's inmates as its test subjects. That's why he was so keen to take part in selections. They gave him an excuse to scan the crowds for anyone with obvious genetic abnormalities that he could study. Club feet, cleft palates, people with dwarfism or hunchbacks. Mengele collected them all for his own private menagerie of genetic oddities. But there was something he prized even more highly than quirky genes. Identical twins. So-called twin studies remain an important tool in science even today. Because identical twins have identical DNA. Well, almost identical, but that's a topic for another video. Some scientists believe this clone-like property makes twins invaluable for studying the age-old question of nature versus nurture. Mengele felt the same way too, and he planned to use his lab to prove that genes, namely Aryan ones, were the deciding factor in the development of desirable traits or phenotypes. He also hoped to find a way to help German mothers give birth to strong Aryan twins of their very own to more quickly repopulate the world according to Hitler's mad ideal. Just think of the scariest, most disturbing scenes from the most extreme horror films you've seen, and they won't even come close to the living nightmare that was Mengele's lab. We'll likely never know the full extent of what went on in those blood-soaked corridors, because the Mad Doctor himself destroyed most of the records when it became clear Germany would lose the war, but what we do know is almost beyond belief. Some of Mengele's twins had their eyes injected with chemicals in an attempt to turn them iron blue, whilst others were made to endure extensive surgeries without anaesthesia, including amputations, organ removals, and castration. In some cases, one twin was deliberately infected with a disease like typhus or tuberculosis. When it killed them, the surviving twin would be murdered too, so that a comparative autopsy could be carried out to study the effects of the disease. 
Mengele claims to be a man of science, looking for answers to important questions, but that was just a mask. Sometimes that facade slipped entirely, revealing the monster beneath. One Auschwitz inmate saw Mengele throw a newborn baby off a camp roof, and another saw him kill 14 children in a single night by injecting chloroform directly into their hearts, one after the other. Another survivor described how Mengele once sewed two children together in an attempt to create artificially conjoined twins. They died of gangrene two days later. This wasn't science, it was murder of the most sadistic variety imaginable. Of the 1,500 sets of twins taken into Mengele's lab, just 200 individuals are thought to have come out alive. Those that died were dissected, with various parts of their anatomy removed for further study. Of particular interest were the eyes, and one entire wall of the lab was full of them, each pinned in place like a butterfly in a display case. Several survivors report that outside of his lab, Mengele often showed kindness to his subjects, insisting that they call him uncle, and handing out candy and milk to the younger children. Sweets in the morning, scalpels in the evening. What kind of monster is capable of something like that? This utter depravity continued unchecked for two years oh, no! until the Angel of Death was forced to leave Auschwitz just before its liberation by the Soviets in January 1945. He fled to Czechoslovakia, where he was eventually captured by the Americans. I wish I could tell you that at this point in the story, Josef Mengele finally got what he deserved. That he was put on trial in Nuremberg and left to rot in the deepest, darkest dungeon for the rest of his days. Sadly, that isn't quite how this story goes. In fact, it's the exact opposite of how this story goes. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Just one month after he was taken into custody, Mengele, one of the most wanted individuals on planet Earth, was released as a free man. As for why, he simply hadn't been correctly identified. There were so many Nazi war criminals knocking around at the time that the Allies were having trouble keeping up with them all, and despite initially being registered under his real name, somehow Mengele slipped through the cracks. He wasted no time going to ground, working as a farmhand in deepest Bavaria for four years before eventually escaping Germany altogether, along one of the so-called rat lines that provided escape routes for Nazi war criminals, mostly to South America. Mengele was able to convince the Red Cross to issue him a passport under the name Helmut Greger, and he used it to make his way to the Argentine capital, Buenos Aires. To begin with, he was sheltered by Nazi sympathizers, but eventually he bought himself a swanky apartment in the city center. To give you an idea of just how unconcerned he was about the possibility of his past catching up with him, Mengele applied for Argentine citizenship under his real name, and he soon got a job working as a regional sales representative for, and I'm not making this up, Carl Mengele and Sons, his father's own company. By the late 50s, he'd apparently decided the folks back in Europe must have put that whole Holocaust business behind them, because he flew back to Germany to visit family and catch up with some old buddies on a skiing holiday in Switzerland. A quick reminder here that we're talking about a man who was personally responsible for 400,000 murders, and he was just going about his business as though the Second World War had never happened. If you're wondering how the hell that was possible, how this despicable human being somehow got away scot-free, the answer is actually quite simple. The rest of the world thought he was dead. Mengele hadn't been seen since he slipped through the Americans' fingers in 1945, and his own family had gone on record to confirm he'd been killed. If he hadn't been so monumentally stupid as to use his real name in his new life in South America, there's a good chance the wider world would never have realized he survived the war. Thankfully, he was that stupid. And that was all it took for famous Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal to get on his trail. In the aftermath of the war, Mengele's wife, Irene, hadn't fancied relocating to South America with her mass murdering husband, and in 1954, the two were officially divorced. Not that Mengele minded, he took the opportunity to marry his dead brother's widow. He really was a classy guy, wasn't he? But of course, marriages and divorces leave a pretty bloody obvious paper trail, and not only did these documents confirm Mengele was still alive, 
they also listed his home address as Buenos hmm. Aires. Having realized Mengele was still at large, Seaman Wiesenthal convinced the West German government to issue a warrant for his arrest. Unfortunately, when police arrived at Mengele's apartment in June 1959, the angel of death had already taken flight. As it happens, Mengele had no idea the authorities were onto him. He'd gone to ground for entirely different reasons. Along with working for the family firm, Mengele had been doing a bit of illegal doctoring on the side, backstreet abortions and stuff like that. When one of those procedures went wrong and a young girl died, the local press started sniffing around. They say no publicity is bad publicity, but I'm pretty sure that doesn't apply when you're a mass murdering sh face. Worried that the attention might lead to some very uncomfortable questions, Mengele swapped Buenos Aires for a remote farm in southern Paraguay, where he gained citizenship in 1959 under the incredibly clever alias Jose Mengele. Despite this frankly embarrassing attempt at covering his tracks, Mengele proved surprisingly hard to pin down in Paraguay, and neither Seaman Wiesenthal nor Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service, were able to bring him to justice. Thankfully, their combined efforts hadn't gone unnoticed by Mengele himself. He now knew he was a wanted man, and that knowledge changed his life. He was forced to relocate once more, this time to Brazil and the spectre of capture hung over him constantly, an incessant worry that frayed his nerves and eventually impacted his health. By the early 1970s, he developed a nervous habit of chewing the tips of his moustache he'd grown to alter his appearance. A compulsion that got so bad, a giant ball of beard hair formed in his intestines, almost killing him. Almost murdering himself with his own moustache seems to have shaken Mengler up a bit because he briefly considered heading back to Germany to seek medical help. The trouble was, he couldn't afford it. By this time, there was now multiple bounties on Mengele's head, which made getting work risky, and his support network of Nazi sympathizers had begun to dwindle. In fact, several of those who still knew his real identity had started to blackmail him, threatening to reveal his secret if he didn't pay up. Mengele kept a diary in the later years of his life, and the entries within reveal a man who was depressed, poor, paranoid, pessimistic, and constantly poorly. It's far from the justice he deserved, but it's something. Sadly, the diary also revealed that Mengele never felt remotely remorseful for the unspeakable things he did, nor did his belief in the Nazi ideology ever waver, even until the end. Speaking of ends, Mengele's came in 1979, when he suffered a stroke while swimming in the sea, not far from Sao Paulo. He survived the stroke, but not the subsequent influx of several litres of seawater into his lungs. He drowned on the 7th of February, almost 35 years after leaving Auschwitz, and was buried under a false name. It wasn't until 1985 that the rest of the world learnt of his fate. West Germany, Israel, and the USA had finally begun to make a combined effort to find him. And the operation eventually led them to a cemetery on the outskirts of Sao Paulo, and a simple grave marked with the name Wolfgang Gerhard. The bones were exhumed, and a forensic analysis concluded that they likely belonged to Josef Mengele. But doubts remained. At the time, the bounty on Mengele's head stood at 3.4 million US dollars, and some people believed the body in the grave was a red herring, planted there by his family to throw investigators off the scent. That theory was put to bed in 1992, when DNA testing confirmed the bones belonged to Mengele. For obvious reasons, the family weren't keen to have his remains returned to Germany, which is how they ended up locked away in a box in Sao Paulo's Institute for Forensic Medicine. They remained there for some 25 years, before a faculty member realised he could put them to use as a teaching aid. We're used to the idea that true, unfiltered evil is something that can't be concealed. Whether it's the terrifying clown makeup of John Wayne Gacy, or the cold, dead eyes of Ed Gein, we assume that a rotten inside will eventually be visible on the outside too. But that wasn't the case for Josef Mengele. This could be a picture of your mate's favourite grandfather. Well, minus the SS insignia. He was handsome, he was charming, he smiled openly and often. And yet, this man wasn't merely a wolf in sheep's clothing. 
He was a monster draped in the skin of a man. During the Second World War, he committed some of the most unfathomably evil acts of any human being that's ever lived, and he did it all with a smile and a sweetie. For my money, the fact that he was never made to pay for those crimes remains one of the biggest travesties of our time. Thanks for watching.